Oh, right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Macos kernel fuzzing. So I'm James, and Alex is down there. He'll be up shortly. Um, so get cracking. Uh, quick agenda, I guess. Uh, so these are the things we're obviously going to cover. So we're going to go through uh, system call fuzzing. We're going to go through our attempts to scale up the fuzzing. Uh, we're going to go over our approach to trying to get code coverage from Macos uh, as part of the fuzzing. Um, and then Alex is going to go over IOKit and mesh fuzzing. Uh, comparisons between our two fuzzers and just some conclusions and any questions at the end. So, uh, OSX fuzz. Uh, this kind of came around um, from our Windows kernel fuzzer, which we released last year at DEF CON. Uh, and the idea being is obviously we want to try and find privesks, you know, for things like sandbox escapes, game root, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we found that the fuzzer that we built last time around was pretty effective. We found a whole bunch of Windows bugs uh, targeted at Windows 7, but it also worked on Windows 10. And it was also pretty scalable as well. Um, the whole point of the fuzzer that we released last year as well was that it could be targeted against other systems. So we wanted to try and see if we could get it to work on MacOS as well, as it's obviously quite a popular target nowadays. And with iOS as well, uh, it seemed like it might be fun. So just go over some basic principles of the fuzzer. Um, the first thing we have is this uh, a bunch of functions which we can call in the fuzzer that just return fuzz data to us. Uh, so these cover all the basic types that you might expect. So you know your ints, your chars, uh, um, uh, everything else. Um, we we say fuzzed values as part of this, but we don't really mean fuzzed. Um, and the reason behind this is we want the fuzzer to actually. Uh, be successful in executing system calls, um, but if you're just putting garbage data, it's just not going to work. Um, the, 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 the OS is going to catch anything that doesn't make sense. So what we do is, is we tend to return sensible values. There are some edge cases in there, but for the most part, we want the, the system calls to work. Um, and as I say on the slide, it, you know, it massively increases our likelihood of the call succeeding, which massively increases the chance of actually finding bugs. Uh, the other part to the fuzzer is um, what we call the object database. Um, and this just allows us to store things that you would use as part of uh, system call arguments as well. So these are things like your file descriptors um, and things like that. Um, so what we do here is we just create a whole bunch of valid uh, objects at the launch of the fuzzer. Um, and every time a system call or some other call returns a valid object back to us, we stick that back into the uh, object database too. Um, and what we do is we pass these objects around throughout a fuzzing run. Um, and this, this kind of works quite effectively in finding things like use after free bugs. Um, it's been pretty successful for that. Um, the, one of the things we've done since we uh, built the fuzzer and presented the fuzzer last year is we can now ask for a specific object type. Um, Obviously, if, you, if, you, if your system calls expecting a file uh, descriptor, but you give it something completely random and garbage, it's going to crash out. So what we do now is uh, the capability to ask it for a specific type. So there's some examples there of get random object by name for IO surface ref and IO connect T. So this is just uh, some code pulled out of the fuzzer, um, just showing that you know, we generate all these objects at the la uh, launch of the fuzzer. So you can see there, we're just building a load of file descriptors and a whole bunch of um, IO connectees as well. Uh, like I say, we can pass those values around uh, during a fuzzing run. So when you ask for an object uh, from the fuzzer, this is actually what you get returned back to as an object struct. Um, what this contains is the uh, value. So this is the value you would pass to the system call. Um, the next thing you get is an index. So this is actually um, an offset into the database. So um, during a repro run, you can't just give it the value you were using before because that value doesn't exist, right? So instead, uh, because the, the fuzzer should work in the same way on each run, you can just call it into the same place in the database and you should get the same uh, thing back. And the other thing you get back is the, the tag. Um, as I said before, you know, you want to make sure that what you're getting back from the object database is what you what you're expecting. So if you're expecting a file descriptor, you'll be able to check to make sure you've actually got a file descriptor back as well. So syscalls. Um, we just pulled the syscalls, uh, BSD syscalls out from uh, the source code, which Apple make freely available. So there's a file in there called syscalls.master. Um, and we also added in uh, main straps as well as a separate table. Uh, initially, we were just incredibly lazy and just uh, 
wrote a script that pulled out all the syscalls and uh, just grabbed all the arguments, and we tried to turn those into uh, argument types that the fuzzer would understand. So if it was an int, we would go, right, get a fuzzed in. Uh, you know, if it was a file descriptor, get a file descriptor from the object database uh, and everything else. And if we didn't know what it was, then we go, well, here's a void star. Try and make sense of that. Um, which kind of worked uh, initially. The other cool thing as well is, um, so initially we were just using assembly uh, for calling the syscalls, but there's actually just a really nice little syscall function that you can call. So you literally uh, give it the uh, syscall you want to call, the arguments, and it goes away and executes it for you uh, and gives you the return value back from the syscall. So no messing around with assembly or anything like that. It's really nice and easy to use. So initially, this is just how a, a, a fuzzing run would look like. So you would go away, you'd pick your syscall, um, you would generate the arguments for that syscall, uh, and then call it. Um, really basic, really easy. As I said, worked okay for really basic syscalls. Um, you know, if it was expecting just an int or whatever, yeah, it'd probably work. Um, vast majority failed um, because they were expecting things like structs or whatever, which we just didn't account for. Um, so we were giving it void start. Obviously, the syscall was picking up on that, and it was just dying. Um, so, and also the maze traps just, just didn't work at all uh, for this. So basically we just had to stop being lazy um, and write actually each syscall individually. Um, you might think that's not a big task, but there's like 500 BSD syscalls or something. So going through those and writing them all individually took a while um, and, and was pretty painful. But we got there in the end. So. What we do now is each syscall is actually a, a separate function. It's the exact same principle, um, but we actually try and make sure that the arguments we're going to provide or potentially provide to the, uh, uh, to the syscall actually makes sense. So this, be, this is things like if it's expecting a struct, well, we'll populate that struct uh, as, it, as it's expected to be populated, but with our sort of fuzz, fuzz data. Um, and, you know, this just ensures that the arguments we're going to provide are roughly correct, which means the syscall is more likely to execute. The syscall is executing, you're more likely to find bugs. So the next bit is uh, logging. Logging in a, in a kernel fuzzer is a bit painful at the best of times, I think. Um, the way we've approached it, which I'm not convinced is the best way, um, is essentially we just log valid C. Um, and, and I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, the reason we did this is we thought, well, it would be really nice if we got a crash and the log file, we could just compile it and then we got the same crash out at the end. Yeah, that's, that just seems nice and easy. Um, and there's also, you know, lots of tools out there for minimizing C files as well. Um, creating these login statements up front is really painful um, and uh, it's just taken a lot of time. But if you get them correct, it should just work, uh, which is sort of the, the benefit to it, I guess. Um, what we do is we send these logs over a network port to fuzzer control. Um, the reason for this is we were initially saving these to disk, but the uh, log files just wouldn't cache. Uh, so if we got a crash, we would miss the last three or four lines of the log file. So that's kind of not really helpful if you want to try and then reproduce that. Uh, so instead, we, we send this over uh, a network port, and then we wait until we get a response back from fuzzer control, and then we know our log has been received, and we know if we get a crash, we should be able to reproduce it. Uh, so that's an example log file. The other thing we do is uh, we log the seed value. So all the decisions in the fuzz are just use rand. Um, so the idea being is we can just seed rand with the same uh, seed value. And we should be able to just run it again and get the same output. So if for some reason we don't get a, a log file, we, sh we, we should always get the seed value out though, and we can just replay the fuzz. A bit of reverse engineering and debugging, but we should be able to figure out the crash from that. So this is what a function looks like. Um, this is the exit syscall. Probably don't want to fuzz that. You're probably not going to get very far. Um, but what you got here is um, a, we generate a variable ID. So as I said, we're logging valid C, but we, ca uh, we can't obviously then have a whole bunch of variables named the same because you can't compile that. So what we do is generate a random number to append to our variables. Um, so then what we're doing there is we're getting an int. So we're just getting a fuzz uh, int 32. We'll log in the value that got returned to us. Uh, what we then do is uh, we log the syscall that we're about to execute. Obviously, we need to log this before we actually execute it, because it, you, you can't log if you've got a kernel crash after the syscall. Um, 
And then the other thing we do is uh, we log the return value as well. And this is actually quite helpful for debugging. So if we have lots and lots of uh, uh, syscalls that appear to be failing, we can quickly just grep through the, uh, the log files and figure out which ones are crashing and then try and fix them up uh, as well. Um, we also have a whole bunch of what we call library calls, but essentially this is just sort of a catalogue of common API calls. So these are things covering things like IO service, uh, the hypervisor, IO HID library, and IO kit as well. Uh, again, it's the exact same principle where we're using the, uh, the, the git fuzzed values and the object database as well. And again, we've had some success from this as well and getting some bugs out. Uh, so this is the IO connect ad ref. Um, as you can see there, all it's doing is grabbing a uh, object. Uh, and then calling it, uh, and then we're just returning the, uh, uh, we're logging the return value as well. So this is what our new fuzz loop looks like. Um, so essentially what we do is we choose either a library call, a syscall, or a maze trap. We generate the arguments for it, and uh, we make the call. And what we do is we have uh, an execution limit, so either we hit our execution limit uh, and we stop, or we've got, preferably, a uh, crash. Uh, and then we can grab the kernel dumps and the log files and stuff. Um, so that's it for OSX fuzz. Next up is uh, how we went about scaling up the fuzzing, uh, uh, the fuzzer, sorry. Um, so obviously we want to be able to run this at scale because you're much more likely to get bugs. Um, the other thing we're really keen on is we kind of just want to be able to do this in a click and let it run kind of way. So we want things that are going to capture our bugs, grab our kernel dumps, you know, revert the VM for us and carry on a fuzzing run. What we don't want to do is sit and babysit the fuzzer essentially. Um, so what we have is a whole bunch of Python scripts that basically control everything uh, for this. So in Fusion, um, we, we, we basically make heavy use of VM runs. So uh, uh, VMware exposed a nice API so we can give it a VM, it'll go away, snapshot it for us, uh, copy the, the fuzzer binary across, um, set up all our uh, uh, logger stuff, set up our panic daemons and everything else, uh, and we can just let it run. Uh, we don't have to worry about it. The next thing we've been looking at is uh, QMU. Um, obviously, you have to run this on Mac hardware. It's part of their licensing agreement, and we obviously do this if Apple were here. Uh, but the reason we did this is we wanted to, uh, to investigate code coverage support, which is a little bit easier under QMU. Uh, there were a few challenges to this. Um, so we had to mess around with OF, OVMF and Clover for NVRAM support. We also had to use um, the IO net driver, um, because otherwise uh, we, can, we can't use the IO kernel debug interface, which you know, we, we need, if we get a crash, we weren't able to uh, send our kernel dumps out over a network port. And also, uh, the final remaining issue we've got at the moment is memory snapshot support. So in Fusion, we can just revert to a snapshot, which is a lot quicker. Uh, under QMU, what we have to do is reboot the whole, uh, uh, whole uh, VM uh, if, if we get a crash or if we hit our execution limit. So this is just a sort of diagram uh, of how that all works. Um, so we have a whole bunch of OSX fuzzes uh, running on top of a bunch of MacOS guests, which run on top of a hypervisor. Then on our host, we have um, our logger and our Python scripts controlling everything with the panic daemon. Um, so what we have is sort of three or four Macs set up. Um, and what they do is push all the crashes out to CouchDB. Um, the reason for this is we want to be able to have a centralized place for all our crashes, but we can also do some basic deduplication of stuff as well uh, based on that. So if we've another you know, host or whatever seen uh, the same crash, we'll just dump it out, we're not interested. And we also do some really basic um, exploitability checks as well. Uh, so moving on to co-coverage, um, we've only really recently started looking at how we might utilize this. So um, at the moment, we're utilizing NCC's Triforce uh, for the co-coverage. It's a pretty cool project. Um, like I said, we've only got a really basic setup at the moment. Um, and again, we've had a few challenges with this. We've had to backport all the QMU patches uh, to support latest Mac or Sierra on top of the patches uh, we've had to do to get it to work anyway. Um, but what we will do is we'll publish these changes we've made uh, to support MacOS uh, to Triforce, whether we push those into the Triforce project or make them available some other way. Uh, we'll try and get those out next week. 
uh, so other people can uh, get involved in this as well. But this is how it sort of works uh, at the moment with our code coverage support. So what we're doing is we're choosing one of those calls, so whether that's our library call or our syscall or uh, mage trap. What we do then is we start our tracing uh, in the kernel, we make our call, we stop the tracing, and then we take our coverage information. Um, at the moment, we're still working out on how to really effectively utilize that uh, code coverage information, um, but these are some of the things we want to be able to do with it. So we want to be able to take the information and understand, obviously, if it's hit new paths, because that's going to potentially be more interesting to us. You know, so if, if it does, then we want to keep that call, keep the arguments that hit the new paths and use it for future runs, maybe tweaking the, the arguments or something. And the other thing that would be really useful for us is if we're hitting, um, or we're just constantly hitting the same paths or whatever, we might be able to do some more debugging, you know, or figure out ways to just not waste cycles. Um, I'd say it needs a fair bit of work at the moment. Um, our original design really just didn't take into account code coverage. You know, our, our sort of feeling on it was, well, we're getting bugs, why bother? Um, but it feels like it'll be a nice, uh, nice thing to have going forwards. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Alex, who's going to talk about the in-memory fuzzing part. Yeah, thanks, James. So basically, James's approach was looking at the BSD side of um, of MeshOS, but there's different subsystems within MeshOS, for those of you who aren't that familiar. So there's the um, IOKit side, um, which is the device driver stack, and also the Mesh uh, microkernel side, essentially. So my idea was to focus on the common vulnerability classes, so things where there's basically lots of bugs being um, like found in, uh, in the past. For, so the device driver stack, IOKit, it basically comes up in every um, Apple uh, patch, uh, security patch release. And so it's a common source of issues. So things like IO connect call method, that's where um, essentially user space can pass uh, data to kernel space to a device driver, uh, to an IOKit driver, um, and handle that and call the selector and so on. There's also the IO registry, which is used for um, persistent properties. Um, so things which the device driver is going to act on. Then there's shared memory mappings where the user space can um, request the kernel maps some memory which is shared between the uh, user space and kernel space. And then finally, a time of check and time of uh, use issues. So I basically wanted to write a fuzzer which would find these kind of issues. The, the approach I took was to um, combine static binary analysis, so as much information as I can possibly get from uh, the binaries themselves with, um, with also some kind of dynamic side as well. Um, I, I also wanted to do as much as I could within memory because every time you touch disk, it slows down your fuzzer. And um, with fuzzing, like if you can get as much execution cycles as possible and uh, finding bugs is easier. So um, for this fuzzer, I developed um, three different components. Uh, they're basically, one, they're called Coral Sun, the first one, which is an IOKit um, mesh library. But essentially, that's um, used for calling, um, well, using Python to call C functions and IOKit functions. Uh, then there's the uh, KXT lib, which is used for extracting uh, data from the KXTs, from the device drivers, uh, written in IDA Python. And then finally, the, the fuzzer itself called Opal Robots, um, which is like the fuzzing component and sniffing component of the architecture. Uh, I'm using code names as well, just because it seems to be the cool thing to do at the moment. And I'm not very good at naming projects, so yeah. Um, but there are similar approaches already. Like there's been a kernel-based, um, I think, uh, a Keen Team or Tencent have been um, doing similar stuff, but. Uh, they've never released any code, so. Um, so firstly, the um, the wrapper library, it's called Coral Sun. It's uh, written in Cython, which is um, essentially a way of compiling C within Python. Um, and it basically makes it a quick way of just like testing out, prototyping, fuzzing ideas. So common things which you do when you're um, fuzzing IOKit device drivers, you'd want to like open a connection to the, to the IOKit service. 
You'd like to call methods uh, using IO connect call, map in shared memory, essentially the vulnerability classes which I talked about previously. I was just writing wrappers for this um, and to support it. Um, I guess that's quite small, so one sec. Hopefully you can see that. Um, but essentially this just gives an example of um, you can write C code inside of the Python and then essentially have that um, to handle type conversions between Python and C without actually having to write lots of um, native C with the Python interpreter. Um, and it just, it, it's quite similar to Swig, if you're familiar with that. But I like, um, I like Cython for quickly writing this prototype code. Um, and you can see it can do things like native memory management using malloc. So taking this as an example, um, IO connect call method um, essentially takes an array of um, scalar values. So in Python, that would be a Python array. Then I can manually allocate memory for that. Um, oops. Yeah, manually allocate memory. Um, and then the type conversion will be handled automatically. So. Um, and with these, I basically did this. I wrote wrappers for uh, the different, like, sort of common areas of vulnerability classes and common methods. So mapping shared memory, um, setting IOKit registry properties, and also sending mesh messages. So the mesh side of things, there's, um, there's a big IPC subsystem from sending messages from, like, a low-privilege process to a high-privilege process uh, across the trust boundary. So you can use that to kind of, like, exploit higher-privileged services as well. Um, then, so that was my utility library kind of underpinning the whole thing, but um, I needed a way of essentially pulling out as much information as I could to build up the attack surface of IOKit. Um, so I wanted to automate the extraction of the details from the KXTs. Using um, IDA Python, I, I basically scripted this up to build like a JSON representation of, of the device driver. And then that way, you could get like a visual representation of the device driver's attack surface. And also, it could be consumed by the fuzzer and used by the fuzzer. Um, I batch ran that against all of the KXTs. There's quite a few. There's like maybe a couple of hundred of uh, device drivers um, and things which you can do to extract this kind of the, the, um, the attack surface from that. So that's kind of my, my pipeline of how things work. Extract, stat, use uh, static binary analysis to extract the attack surface in IDA Python, produce some JSON, and then feed that into the uh, fuzzer itself, Opal Robot. Um, so how do we kind of pull these things out? Well, we, what do we want to extract? Well, we want to extract um, the I.O. services, so the services which you can call. Under each I.O. service, there's um, different user clients, which are um, essentially C++ uh, like classes for, um, for the device drivers and things which you can uh, instantiate. Uh, within the kernel. Um, there's also a number of dispatch tables called, um, which are called IO external method and IO external method dispatch, um, which, are the, which provide you with the arguments for um, IO connect call. Um, and also finally, I'd like to extract things like the shared memory mappings, if the de device driver supports it, or the registry uh, properties, like if you can set a, like a string property, then what are those string properties? So the way of doing that, um, that's kind of the, the pseudocode algorithm for this. Um, to, I, I used two methods. The first way was using um, IDA X references and like kind of code flow tracing to basically determine what function's called, uh, look for a symbol name, and then from that symbol name, walk the graph and find out um, the, what I'm looking for. Um, so, for example, for matching I/O services, then if you loop through every function within the code segment, if it contains new user client in the name, then um, it's instantiating a new, new user client, a new I/O kit user client. And then, if you look for the X references from that, and look for type constants, then that's probably a user client. Um, so that was a reasonably good heuristic for matching um, these things within the binary. Then. Same thing with the uh, like IO existing IO external method matching as well. You can do, loop through um, everything in the const segment, 
every line in the disassembly, look for cross-references for the function names which you're looking for, and then process that table as well. Um, that kind of worked OK, but um, it, would, it would miss certain things. So I wanted to supplement that with another kind of binary matching mechanism as well, um, which is just essentially dumb pattern matching on the structs. Because the compiler um, will basically compile these structs um, and their hard-coded arguments into the const section of the binary, you can just look for, um, you can loop over every line within the const segment, it, see if the lines uh, cross-reference to something in the, uh, in the code segment, so it's a function pointer. Um, followed by four bit integers, then um, it's likely that it's an IO external method uh, dispatch struct. Um, that's a pretty good heuristic and actually pulls out most of the, um, the IO kit device driver uh, dispatch tables. Um, this, there's a few which do their own, like do their own thing. I don't really know why this is, but, um, and they just kind of require manual reverse engineering. Um, I think you could probably improve this, like if you take into account like C++ uh, inheritance and Vtable structure and how the compiler creates, um, like does, does uh, C++, but um, my way worked and I was kind of in a hurry and to find bugs, so it was good enough. Um, so what does this look like? Um, so here's just an example of um, IO connect call method arguments being, pulled, being converted to JSON um, for the Intel accelerator driver. So you can basically see for the, for the IO user client in there, then the different selector numbers, which are the methods which you can call in the kernel, the arguments, the number of arguments it takes, the size of the data, and the number of the output arguments and so on as well. Um, you can also see it pulls out things like the, the shared memory mapping side of things um, yeah. So that's pretty good, but there's some limitations on what you can actually do with like kind of stack, the static binary side. Like you know the size of the arguments, so you're going to get um, reasonably like y y your fuzzing isn't going to get rejected straight away by by checking of the um, of the number of arguments. It's going to get into the function at least, but the data which you're passing into the function that might not be valid. So you might not get very good code coverage because your data gets checked, validated. So really I wanted like a sample of um, data which, uh, which would get me deeper within the functions and allow me to get better code coverage. Um, there's also things like issues with like kernel capture. Like if you say, if you get a kernel panic and then you dump it out from, the, from kernel space, so you do your instrumentation on the kernel side, then I think it makes reproduction and logging actually harder. So I wanted a way which I could capture this from user space as well and know that I could actually definitely um, trigger the issues. So my idea was to use Frida, which is a pretty awesome hooking framework. I, I totally recommend you check that out if you've not heard of it. Um, but yeah, essentially do some hooking, create some pickles of like the data which you've captured and then feed that into the fuzzer. So. Um, so this was, this was developed using two modules. There, there was a sniffing module. So the sniffing module would essentially intercept data from user space to kernel space, dump it to disk by hooking the key functions, and then basically pickling it up, storing it, and, and providing a persistent way of, um, of distributing out the, uh, these pickles to, the different, to my fuzzer. Um, then the fuzzing side, which is the actual like mutation part, that would either load the pickled data if there was some data and then use that as kind of the base for my mutations. Or if, there were, if I didn't have any data, for example, because I hadn't captured any, then um, I would use the um, JSON data, the static binary side, to basically mute, like, pick that data, mutate it, and test it and check if it worked. Um, so here's just a quick example of hooking uh, IO connect call method. Um, in Frida, it's like, like I say, it's really easy to use. It allows you to write JavaScript um, to hook C functions, uh, because it injects a JavaScript interpreter in. So this is just attaching uh, to, the, to the function name, finding the exported symbol, and then getting access to the arguments and being able to dump out the arguments and so on. Um, I use Frida quite a lot for mobile assessments, so it's quite familiar with the APRs. Um, 
there are some challenges with this, though, because um, some of the like I/O service handles and mesh ports they're essentially like opaque to the process itself. So if you take a I/O service reference or mesh port from one process and then move it into another process, it won't really be valid um, because it's not a valid kind of handle. But so the way I got around that was just do even more hooking and basically create uh, like a lookup table to kind of like track the creation of handles and mesh ports and basically map them back to uh, how they were created. And then that way my fuzzer could reproduce the steps and basically reproduce the, um, the exact kind of flow of, yeah, of triggering their code. Um, a quick example of this is that, um, so here's another hook on the iOS service open method, which um, essentially re resolves the, the class at um, runtime, looks at the class at runtime so you know what device driver, um, well, or what calling processes, uh, what service has been opened. Then when the function returns, then um, I essentially read out the data from the, the handle, check, put it in my map, and then that way I've got a lookup of, of the handles. So, yeah, quite simple. Um, so what does this look like? This basically allows, like, builds up a bunch of pickles of the attack surface. You can see there's like things for the different IO kit services, Apple Keystore, IO Bluetooth controller, IO Surface, et cetera. And I'm getting a reasonably decent um, sample size. Like if you look at say the selector numbers and what methods I've been capturing through the, um, through the hooking. Um, and just a quick example as well of, uh, that's just a pickle of me storing the data on disk. Um, which has been captured from the, uh, from the hooking as well, so, yeah. Um, so the problem with that is that when you um, run a process on MacOS, that um, essentially it'll open similar, um, like similar connections to the IO kit drivers every time. It'll open up a connection to the, um, to the Intel accelerator, the Windows Manager and so on. It, there isn't really that much variation of, um, of the data which you're capturing. And really you want to extend as, like capture as much data as you can to get as much of the attack surface for fuzzing. So what I did was um, I wrote some, like I was thinking about this, like how could I do this? I could just sit in front of my computer and then hook things and then use it, but that's pretty like time consuming and like a bit of a pain because you have to like go through all the menus and stuff and it's just like, it's not very cool. Um, so instead, I just wrote some UI automation to just click, click buttons, like slide stuff, and just generally just do loads of crazy shit with the UI. And um, yeah, and they capture, and that allows you to capture as much data as possible. Um, so things like the, like QuickTime, FaceTime, um, like the settings app, they basically generate loads of, uh, yeah, they basically generate loads of different traffic, so. Um, but the problem is as well, like you need to make sure that you blacklist certain UI calls because you don't really want the, the VM shutting down like because it's doing loads of crazy actions, like it just goes off and then you've got no captures, you're like, oh great, like, yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, the mutation side, you basically got all of this data, you've got your static binary analysis scripts, um, well your static binary analysis JSON, You've got the, um, the pickled data. You want to feed it to your fuzzer now. So basically choosing the, the pickled data or choosing the JSON data, mutating it, and then finally making the call, as you, as you do with any fuzzer, really. Uh, I also implemented support for leak detection as well. So all the data which is coming back from kernel space to user space, uh, it's possible that kernel pointers will be leaked, and then you could use those to find KSLR bypasses or other kind of kernel memory leaks, which would be useful for, uh, um, for exploitation. Yeah. Um, the architecture is pretty much the same as, the, as James described. Um, however, I was using, uh, like I was scaling out the JSON and the pickles to my different open robot instances. And then that way, um, that, that was shared between all my different VMs. So I could have some VMs doing sniffing, some v like data capture, and other VMs doing mutation, and basically increasing my, my data sets um, and, yeah, mutation. 
and then finally feeding all the repros back to my database and um, so I could do triage and uh, logging and so on. So what did it, what did it find, like, and how do these fuzzes kind of compare at the moment? Um, the so OSX fuzz, like, it's found quite a few user after freeze. Um, it's found a number of heap overflows. Um, we kind of expected that because the design choices which were made with um, OSX fuzz, like the way it was kind of like reusing um, essentially descriptors and then freeing memory and then using it again. It was kind of, yeah, that was kind of a common vulnerability pattern with the fuzzer. Um, Opa Robot also found like similar issues, but it was finding some interesting stuff with like uninitialized memory, like being used as like a function point of call or um, yeah, within kernel space. I also found a number of issues with um, the I.O. registry as well, with like writable I.O. registry properties. Um, so the issues which have been fixed so far have got CVE numbers on there. There's still a few which are like outstanding or ones I haven't triaged yet. So, um, so they should be coming up within the next kind of patch releases and uh, when I get around to actually triaging stuff because I'm quite slow at doing that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically the syscall fuzzer, like it's good for use after freeze in the core new kernel code, in the open source uh, new code. Um, yeah, the IO kit is still a pretty good source of bugs. Like Apple have gone to uh, a lot of extent now to introduce entitlements on, um, on the IO kit drivers to basically reduce the attack surface and prevent you from speaking to IO kit drivers. But if you can either bypass the entitlements or uh, hit things which aren't protected by entitlements, then you could possibly find bugs in those. Um, it's also really important when you're fuzzing as well to focus on like new areas. So things like when new syscalls are added or when uh, new functionality is added to an OS. Um, so for example, with, with XNU, like because it's open source, you can diff it against the previous version. You can see what's being added, and then you can feed that information into developing your fuzzer and adding like new functionality to hit the new areas. Um, so code review definitely helped me from like um, with the Apple open source stuff, basically uh, helped me focus on some of the new like new syscalls, for example. Um, also, just scaling Mac OS is more challenging like than Windows. Like there's been a lot of uh, like talks on um, scaling up Windows and cloud support and stuff, and you don't really have that with Mac OS. Um, so what do we want to do in future? Well, basically, we want to, yeah, we want to scale it up even more. We were thinking about investigating um, like, um, like constraint solving or um, like concolic execution or any of the kind of more mathematical ways of, uh, of fuzzing to, to kind of uh, explore more code paths and things, but right now it wasn't really necessary because we like find bugs even just like doing it like this. So, um, the I also would like to explore iOS integration as well and like um, porting my fuzzes across to the mobile platform and seeing what these issues affect iOS. Um, I've also recently written some code in which would uh, target the IPC subsystem. Because there's quite a lot of services you can hit, higher privileged services which you can get from. Um, so a low privileged service can send messages to a high privileged service across the trust boundary. And then if you exploit those, you can elevate your privileges. Um, and we also need to do more work on the code coverage and feedback side. Because right now we've got the code coverage data, but we need to make best usage of, of this to drive the fuzzer and provide the feedback. So. Um, I want to open source as much of this as possible, so um, I'm going to start off by releasing my Cython um, IO kit code um, to make it like, quick to write um, IO kit um, fuzzing or IO kit communication type stuff. Um, we're also going to release an updated version of OS X fuzz, which is built on the Windows kernel fuzzer. So those should be available at, uh, at, at our GitHub. Um, at github slash labs. And also, I'd just like to say thanks to all the people who have uh, done work in this area previously as well. Like, I was kind of new at um, Mac OS. Uh, I come from a Windows background. I've been doing Windows for like a long time. So it's taken a while to get up to speed on, um, on Mac OS and learn about it and learn the internal type side of things. So some of the people like Ian, P Ian B has done loads of uh, good bug hunting 
uh, for Project Zero. Like Mooney Lead has spoke at PackSec about doing kernel fuzzing, but from a um, uh, but from a slightly different perspective. Um, and then there's been numerous talks previously on IOKit as well, like over the last like six years or something. And then finally, there was a, a Python talk as well about OS X, so, but which there was no code released from. Yeah. Um, that's it, really. So are there any questions? Mm -hmm.